Hey guys, welcome back to the Fenica Podcast. Today we had a long-awaited guest, Talal Yassin, who's been on our, who was one of the first people we actually wrote down that we won on the Fenica Podcast. You guys are going to love this episode. Today we got to speak about his journey migrating to Australia and how his parents pushed education for him to become school captain and then to go get four degrees at university. After that, he pursued law and he got offered partnership at PwC and he turned that down when he was married and had two kids to follow his passion and start the first Islamic superannuation company, Crescent Wealth. You guys are going to love this episode. He talks about how, what success is, what work-life balance is, how to pursue your passion. Inshallah, you guys enjoy it. Take some notes and remember to subscribe. Didn't go to school at all. Um, but for some reason, I'm still trying to work out why. My parents really wanted education. And uh, we went to Gra- I went, went to Granville Boys High School. That's like Broadmeadows High. <laughs> So just so you're aware, like that's what the school I went to. So half my years in jail, and I'm not exaggerating. I was a school captain of a year that half is is in jail or dead. We know that empirically because we tried to do a 25th anniversary, and I wasn't going to do it in jail. (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah, I reckon best way to start it is with flow. I don't know if you're happy with that because usually when we start going, hi, how are you? Oh, yeah, let's flow. No, no, no. (laughs) So, no time for that. (laughs) To flow, quick question. Yeah. Have you ever Googled yourself? I Google myself at least once a week. (laughs) (laughs) And you've been there at least once a week. Mm. It's called a vanity search. Mm. Um, And whoever called it that must have had real issues. But for me, who you are online, actually represents who you are today. True. Everybody, you're sitting there talking to somebody, like right in front of you, they'll Google you. Like right in front of you. Someone who, like that you're sitting there talking, oh, look, and I met with this team, and I met Grace, and I met Ashraf, and what's Ashraf's last name? Oh, he, they Google immediately as they're talking to you on Zoom. So if you actually don't know what's on Google about you, mm-hmm. you actually don't know who you are, mm. in effect. So at least once a week, I Google myself. I go through the first five pages. But the first page I focus on. Oh, well. Okay, beautiful. Because I was going to say, this, this sounds so irrelevant now that I look yeah. at it. <laughs> I was going to say, I looked at your, your date of birth yeah. and it said 2nd of January. 1st of January. It, first, first, sorry, 1st yeah. of January. January yeah. Which made me laugh because yes. that's the same thing as everybody else. I think my dad and you share a birthday. Yes. And so 16 of my other Our parents had good timing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> everybody timed it perfectly. Timed it perfectly. After the fireworks, <laughs> everyone was popping out. <laughs> Yeah, but that's right. why I was laughing. I was like, subhanAllah. Yeah, yeah, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and then you started speaking about I had to Google and do a vanity search. I'm like, damn, maybe yeah. this wasn't going down the same path. I wanted yeah. to go down. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, it's good. It's good. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for us to break the ice, inshallah. Yeah. For, for people who don't know, inshallah, we're going to add a little trailer at the start in order yeah. for us to develop on who you are as a person and why we brought you on as a guest and why we think you're going to be of great benefit to not only ourselves, inshallah. but to the audience, inshallah. Mm. So, um, well, welcome Talal Yassin onto the podcast. Thank you. Um, Pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> amazing you came down. We've, this has been in the works for how long? About six, seven months now? Something like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> busy, busy guy, yeah. mashallah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess I guess this is a good way to kind of segue into speaking about your date of birth. We'll talk a little bit about your upbringing and your early life because... Um, I think one thing that's well documented is that you're from a low socioeconomic background and you had, how many brothers and sisters was it? I, I still have them, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> I did eight of us, so I'm the oldest of eight and I got uh, the six boys all together, so I got five uh, brothers and two sisters. Yeah, and yeah. You grew up in the main streets of yeah. Sunshine? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up in, the, in, for a lot of your listeners are in Melbourne, so I grew up in the equivalent of Sunshine. A suburb called Guildford and Auburn, mm. um, which is pretty well known in Western Sydney. Yep. Uh, you know, the area, Guildford, Marylands, Auburn, uh, which is different than the Kemba Banks down, so it's got a different pocket, mm. you know. It's kind of like Altona New- and Newport and Sunshine, etc. Mm. Uh, but interestingly, I have a lot of relatives that still live in Sunshine. So as I was coming here to the studio and mm. I look around the street as I arrive, it's like, from my childhood memories, you know, yeah, of sunshine, which is great, great memories of mm. seeing Rellos in uh, Melbourne. We'd come down once a year mm. at Christmas time. And, um, and so I guess they could be called the mean streets, the Bronx, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> but, um, 
but it's where I grew up, you know, it's where, where I belong, where, where I uh, found myself and who, who, who I am, really. Mm. Um, I know you you and your family migrated from Lebanon. Just know, were you from the city in Lebanon or were you from... No, we were from the country. So the we country? went from a village called Izal, I-Z-A-L, Lebanon, okay. um, which is north, north Lebanon, like next to the Syrian border. Mm. And um, we, we were tobacco farmers um, because nothing grew up there. You know, tobacco mm. doesn't need much water. Um, <clears throat> we were closed off for six months of the year. A few years ago, we were celebrating. We got a road up there. And um, there's still no telephone lines. It's like when Wi-Fi came on, it was heaven. And uh, it's about an hour north of Tripoli. And so when we came here, like a lot of Lebanese, so we're talking about the, the story about coming to Australia. So you recall that, you know, a lot of Lebanese came out here in about 76, 77, 78, 79, about then. And that was because of what they called the Lebanese concession, um, the Australian government term, the Lebanese concession. And basically there was like the Vietnamese boat people. There was a war, Lebanon, 1975. It broke out. Hundreds of thousands of people were dying. So the Australian government, we needed people in Australia to work. I think it was in Melbourne, the ACI factory. Um, the so Ford factory? No, no, the ACI. It was a glass making factory before your oh. time. Um, well, that came in and they needed because you guys are about half my age, oh. so <laughs> it's definitely yeah. closed down. Okay. And the Ford factory and yeah. the Holden factory, they've closed down now too, right? Yeah. So, and then they said, "Oh well, this in Lebanon when uh, 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 shit started hit the fan, the wealthy went to where they, their second home in London, Paris, mm. New York. The middle class, the doctors, lawyers, accountants, they went to like North Africa, Dubai, but the working class." in the city mm. and the country folk or subsistence farmers like my parents, they had nowhere to go. Mm. And so Australia was a huge offer. So about a couple of hundred thousand came out here all at once and we were part of that group. Sure. And so when we arrived in Australia <clears throat> on the 18th of January 1977, um, that's a very important date because I don't remember that date because, well, one, we arrived in Australia, but two, in Sydney, <clears throat> the biggest disaster in Australian train history happened, the Granville Bridge disaster. Uh, a train fell, a uh, bridge fell on a train in Granville mm. and killed 144 people, I think, or something to that effect. And um, that's why we remember every year, we com like the whole of Australia commemorates, well, certainly New South Wales. Yeah. And it's, uh, that's 46 uh, years ago now. I, I brought that up <coughs> on purpose because when, when we were doing research on your story, it showed like that you're from a low socioeconomic household, but your family really pushed education. And at least we know, because a lot of the Lebanese here from Melbourne, they're, they're from the village. And when they come here, they're not pushing education. And I saw, you can probably correct me, but it said um, with your eight siblings, there's about 30 degrees between eight of you. Yeah, the panel. When I saw that. It's like with a really yeah. pushing education. Yeah, education was really important in my family. Uh, both mum and dad didn't go to school at all. Mm. Like, can't read, write Arabic or English. Um, mm. And so that's the way I define the middle class, right? Mm. So people who are of educated parents, like if your parent happens to be a teacher or a doctor or or, or something, just yeah. something, or even a tradie, you know, uh, I, I consider you middle class these days. Yeah. If you if you're, but my parents had no profession and didn't go to school at all. Um, but for some reason, I'm still trying to work out why. My parents really wanted education. And uh, we went to Gra I went, went to Granville Boys High School. That's like Broadmeadows High. <laughs> <laughs> so just so you're aware, like that's what the school I went to. So half my year's in jail, and I'm not exaggerating. Oh, wow. I was a school captain of a year that half is, is in jail or dead. We know that empirically because we tried to do a 25th anniversary and I wasn't going to do it in jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I, was no, I was not going to go to uh, Her Majesty's Pleasure because it was a socioeconomic area that we grew up in, right? Yeah. And so not to coat it in any way. Mm. Um, and we're trying to work out even as a, a family for us, w why? W why my cousins became taxi drivers and tradies and plumbers and worse – because um, I think that's brilliant. If you did that, that's a great thing. Because I don't, I mean, university education is a great thing, but mm. being a good tradie is equally as good. You know, there's no double cost. There's no levels. Yeah. In my view, every everything's valid. There's no there's no shame in work. 
Um, and we'll talk about what I did uh, you know, only, only five years ago, six years ago. I gave up my taxi license, you know. So um, the uh, and so we drove cabs, but we did we did all, all uh, things everybody listening to this podcast are doing, you know, mm. trying to make it. And we're a family of eight. Um, we lived in Western Sydney. Parents, uh, my, both mum and dad didn't end up working. My dad worked at James Hardy. Uh, you know, with the asbestos, you know, that, that, yeah. that, that he worked in there. Alhamdulillah, nothing happened to him at all, physically, uh, and in terms of medical. But he, they were looking after us. And so we still can't work out why we... Because it's not like my mum and dad could help us with homework. Mm. It's not like we went to a great school, you know. It's not like... It, 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 but we... One thing we did have was unconditional love. Two, an expectation without expectation. So what we mean by that is that Mum and Dad, like, are you studying? I'm to Are you? Uh, how are you going? You know, how are things? Because they could not tell how we were actually going. Mm. But at the same time, if I became, you know, my dad wasn't a lawyer or a doctor, and you know, you had to live up to well, I got to be like my dad. You know, I call it the middle class expectation syndrome, where there's kids are stressed because they don't follow in the footsteps of their dad or their mum, who are brilliant. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that gave us a bit of freedom, right? So if I so basically, if I made it out of school without getting a a, 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 a criminal record, I did well. <laughs> so that was the expectation, right? <laughs> what a bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so this is where I kind of think about, like, you made me think about, for example, the expectations that parents put on their kids, you mm. know? And um, one thing that I noticed was the fact that, like, you have people that they live their lives or they live their dreams through their kids. So do you feel like part of that would have been, like, your parents... You know, like you know, the soccer, the soccer dads and the the mm. football dads. How they've always wanted to play, like major leagues or mm. in like the Premier League or so on. And then they push their sons or their daughters to do it. It's like they didn't have the chance to, so yeah. they really want to push their kids to do that. Or do you feel like it was just out of like they see the benefit in 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 education, so they kind of pushed you guys to mm. to pursue that. I, I think my parents, um, they they were. The second one, not the first one. My parents weren't tiger parents uh, for education. You know, soccer dad, yalla, come on, move it. <laughs> Hurry up, get up, move, mm. you know. It wasn't any of that. They, they were too busy to do that. Mm. There's eight of us. They barely got through life, right? <laughs> uh, that micromanaging of us, like, wasn't, like, that That didn't happen. Um, but they, did, they wanted us to do better and have, um, and have a better life and to actually get educated. But even till today... When my dad comes and introduces Suhail to me, he says, Suhail Mata'allam. Suhail is educated. And I go, so what do you mean, Dad, Mata'allam? He finished school. Like, that's his level, mm. right? And so, to some extent, my parents in particular succeeded beyond their wildest dreams, but actually, they're victims of that as well. I get you. Right? They're victims of that as well. Because if their sons are have masters and are professors and went to Harvard and are uh, thinking of esoteric things and, you know, f- structured financial products and, like, they're, like, still, like, I went to the job site. What do you do? I built, like, that. And, and they're not unintelligent people. They're very intelligent people but just don't understand the ways of Australia. And to some extent, when we come home and talk to them, <laughs> I don't understand either, uh, <laughs> um, and, and talk to them, um, we, we have trouble explaining where we got to because they, alhamdulillah, support us and educate us at a level where we're contributing to, hopefully, to the community mm. and uh, to our community and the social fabric of Australia in a way they, they, they just just barely get. Yep. Um, especially with my dad, because he's, my dad's a, uh, my mum is a, is a person who is, you know, get up in the morning, go hard, do the hard work, don't stop, you're standing still, move, you know. Yeah. Um, well, my dad's the complete opposite. He's like, I don't know, so I'm like, calm down. A nuclear war? Oh, have a coffee. It's okay. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> and that yin and that yang. Mm. And um, so we had that. And, and, and the reason we were never known to the police ever, I think also at the school, was we were a hell of a lot more afraid of my mum than the police. <laughs> 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 Who'd rather be arrested by the police <laughs> than please don't tell my mum. <laughs> Of <laughs> course, uh, I mean, I, and we had a few good breaks as well, of course. But my mum was and my dad were really supportive of that, and they su- 
they when they support us, they weren't talk, like you got to do this. Don't embarrass me. You got to you know. It was none of that. It was more like I'll take you to the class. I'll take you to school. You got a bad report because your brother read the report to me. And your other brother confirmed it. The validation process because they're not reading it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, hey, I'm gonna read Talal's report. Bilal, I'm alright. <laughs> okay, you know, it's a three way police interview. <laughs> Um, oh, two step yeah, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Um, so yeah, my mum like then she she'd actually go and talk to the teachers. She'd show up, you know, um, and say, "Well, my son didn't do well in English. Why? Mm-hmm. Um, can you explain to me?" And the teacher like she wouldn't know what was wrong. She knew he got to see. Yeah. But I want my what can I do? You know, and um, in the schools we went to, uh, most of them anyway, because I went to two or three of them, um, you know. That was very unusual, very unusual to actually care about education mm. and where you got to get, like everybody's aim was to, to get through it, whilst our aim was to get through it and succeed. Mm. Mm. So when, when, I look, when I look at, for example, uh, your story and then I compare that to mine, one thing that stands out to me is the fact that I know that a lot of Lebanese parents, they value hard work, but they don't really understand what quality work is in comparison to hard work and... Um, one thing that I tried to explain to my old man once because he's a fruit and vegetable mm. provider and he goes around <coughs> delivering fruit and veg early to different people and so on. But um, he always felt, and this is, he actually turned to me in the car a couple of days ago, uh, sorry, a couple of weeks ago, and he looked at me and he goes, yes, subhanAllah, all this time I felt like if I wasn't working as hard and I wasn't breaking my back and I wasn't, you know, pushing and, and it wasn't hurting me, like that, that means I'll, I'm not really benefiting. But then I look at, What's going on now in the world? And there's people that sit down in an office in a, in an air-conditioned room doing absolutely nothing and they get triple, quadruple what I get, you yeah. know? And that's something that I try to relate to my parents. Like, they'll look at me at home yeah. when I'm working from home, doing tak 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 on the computer. Yeah. Just, as they the lab lab? Are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the toys again? And then I started to, 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 to tell them, like, hey, like, this is actually, like, yeah. this, this is making a living, you know? It's kind of these days and... That's why I'm like looking at it, and I see this. But like the, you got, I, I my parents have the same thing. So we worked in the markets. My first job was working in the markets, uh, selling fruit. Oh, well, yeah. so you're talking about your parents. My, my, we were there. Probably got my first job. I was 14. Started at three o'clock in the morning, flew to markets, which is like your your markets here. Yeah. Um, and before the hipsters showed up, and the <laughs> alternative, like we still have markets. Mm. Uh, no hipster stuff. So Flemington's hipsters back in no, the no, day? No, 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 it was, it, it was then and it's now a real market. Yep. Farmers bring fruit and they sell it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, so, um, and so I'm very familiar with your dad's view of the world because my, my dad had the same view that you got to work hard. But working hard for them meant physical, mm. meant time. It meant their, their frame of reference was not working smart. But f- f- for smart for them was go to school get better skills to do, to run that fruit shop, yep. you know. Um, they're not thinking, let's do a green juicing, you know, sell a couple of drink, a couple of litres of drink for 27 bucks because I've looked at the paradigm and the movement in the hipsters and now they're drinking kale, <laughs> right? Even yeah. though they're selling it in the markets, right, yeah, for yeah. $2.50 <laughs> a bunch. So they, and, and so, you know, my dad to this day doesn't have that. Fr- he respects what we're doing. We actually didn't understand it, mm. right? And so, and uh, and so, I, I from from your perspective, your dad's got a frame of reference of what success looks like. Mm. And for me, my dad's success if I'm wearing a suit, I'm obviously successful. A white man in a suit, like obviously, you're successful, you know. So their reference is, and even in Western Sydney, if you go to work and come back with clean hands, mm. you know, they're not a mechanic. They think that's success. Yeah. That's a sign of authority, right? And um, that's from North Lebanon. That's from North Lebanon, right? Uh, all of Lebanon, really, except Beirut. Yeah. Um, and where we came from. And, uh, you know, I, I got great respect for people like your dad and my dad and our mums and okay. who, who, who really are now, we're, we're seeing it from the other angle. Like, you don't, you don't understand me, how good I am, you know, all the things I'm doing. Like, <laughs> don't you get it? But from their perspective, right? Um, they ca- if you look at, go back to Lebanon, where they came from, what success looks like, mm. you get a lot more admiration for the fact that they can actually put the pieces together and see that you've succeeded. Now, but 
hard work is hard work. 100%. Right? Whatever you're doing, you've got to do hard work. I've never seen anybody except bank robbers do five minutes of work mm. and all of a sudden become successful, you know? Um, in whatever you do, there's got to be that passion, that vision, that mission. And, and they have it. And their vision and mission is to work hard for their families. Mm. And that's true success for them. Yep. Right? They don't need someone to give them a gong or need to be on a podcast. or <laughs> uh, They don't need any of that shit, right? If their family's happy, they give them that unconditional love. And, um, and, and so they've got a very different view of the world to us, you know? Mm. Yep. That's definite. Um, which reminds me, that topic and you were just speaking about, I reckon we bring it up on another podcast, inshallah, just speaking about... Um, was that that thing that you just said uh, before the getting a, a reward for what you did? A gong. Sorry, remi- remind me, remind me. No, no. I said a lot because <laughs> it was there two seconds ago. Then I lost my train of thought. But yeah. apologies. I, I'll move on anyway, inshallah. When it comes back to me, I'll. Yeah. But I reckon what you're speaking about now, alhamdulillah, is a good segue to speak about your work as a lawyer. Yeah. You know, the white man in the suit. <laughs> so <laughs> do you want to touch on that a little bit, inshallah? Just no, no, no worries. I, I I started off. I think I was probably 10, 11. I probably saw the equivalent of Suits. It was called LA Law. And I, I just wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know why. It was like I decided <laughs> I wanted to be a lawyer. The kid from Western Sydney wanted to be a lawyer. But, but what kind of lawyer? Like just in those days, and some extent in these days, but definitely then, it's 25, 30 years ago. Mm. You know, in a, in a Sunshine West, there were like three or four important people. And there were many towns, right? Mm. Called them suburbs, but... There was a lawyer, doctor, maybe a pharmacy, post office, and a publican or a bank manager. They're the kind of authority figures. I want to be that lawyer. I want to be the local lawyer in Guildford. Guildford's a small little suburb in Western Sydney. Uh, very poor then, very poor now, mm. right? Still hasn't been gentrified, even though the average house is 1.5 million now. But, you know, it's still, it's still on every level, poverty levels, education levels, etc. Yeah. A low socioeconomic area. And um, so that's what I wanted to be. And I, I was school captain, thought I was going to duck Scramble Boys High School. In those days, we, well, you call it the VC here. We've been through various versions of it, HSC, ATAR, etc. But it was a higher school certificate. Mm-hmm. And there was scaling. And so I wanted to be, had this grand dream of becoming a lawyer. Forgot who I am and where I was. Got the mark. You know, used to open up in those days. And I just, like, flunked big time. Mm. Big time. They, the, 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 the mark, like, they scale you down for what school you're in and the fact that you weren't good at math. So I'm doing all these reasons that on the bell curve. Yeah. And so that was a – so I looked at it. Remember, never forget, Parramatta Post Office, 6 a.m. in the morning, open up the piece of paper and, it, like, all your hopes, dreams, all mm. gone wow. in, that, in that one second – and, um, and so I ended up recovering from that in a sense by just going to Sydney Uni and doing a BA and doing nighttime law. And then I did a couple of years and transferred into Macquarie University Law. Um, and then I started off my degrees, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. But <clears throat> that's what I wanted to be. I always knew I wanted to be something off service. I wasn't quite sure what that was. But university life opened the world to me. In so many different ways. Mm. So first of all, talking about Lebanese, I went to Granville Boys High School. We were not introduced to the species known as females. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like it was just, just, it was because of our cultural, the way we grew up and our parents, females were either one extreme, Virgin or Mary with hijab, or the other. Very simplistic, you know? And it was a very dangerous thing. In, from, a, from a boy's perspective. So I went to university and met the world, met different kind of males, different kind of females, older, alternate, hip, crazy, stupid, exceptional. And that really helped me grow uh, mentally to see the world uh, from where I was grounded. But I also realised that um, they lived in a different world to me. I come from Sunshine West to Melbourne University equivalent. They were all trust fund babies, um, very wealthy, uh, drove bloody at that time Audis to uni. I drove my dad's van and it wasn't a combo van like I'm a hipster. It was a van with shit at the back which is all stuff in the markets, right? Um, <laughs> and we had bags at the back and so you'd look through it. It was a commercial van, right? 
put my bag, and I, I remember that van very fondly. You used to park it illegally at Sydney Uni because you can get away with it because it's a van, right? Because I always looked like a tradie. Yeah. Um, and when I was at uni, um, you know, you hid that. And the wealthy kids hid their wealth. I hid my poverty relative to them. I wasn't not proud of it, but it was not something you said. I just competed on an open merit basis. And university was the best place because – Whilst there's a lot of wealth and a lot of background, etc., it's also a meritocracy. Because when you do exams, when you go for student leadership positions, when you engage, is a relative meritocracy. Because the world that comes after it is not a meritocracy at all, yeah. right? Yeah, it's structurally very different. But but to answer your question directly, that's how I was. I wanted to be a local lawyer, and I changed my view entirely. I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. I wanted to go on boards. I wanted to lead organisations. Yep. And I realised a law and an arts degree would help me do that. Mm-hmm. And so I got a, a little bit into politics. I became student leader at Macquarie. Um, now, meanwhile, just to, I guess, paint the full picture, I had three jobs. So I drive a cab, double two seven five for seven years on the weekend. Um, I did one day every Wednesday at a law firm mm-hmm. for five years. And I worked at a service station um, uh, for about years as well throughout my university career and afterwards as I was doing student leadership because I still had to fund the family fund myself as all well, like before 28 before I was married had kids all the rest of it mm. and so um, what I learned is that some people have to struggle double to be in the same spot yep. and so my kids now that go to uni that are 20 and 18 are those kids that I was talking about because they're there enjoying their life, really participating, really going hard. And I don't lament them, I don't diss them, but it is a different lens. Mm-hmm. When to show up, you need to travel for an hour and a half after working all weekend. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> so Mondays were always usually a write-off for me because Mondays was I would have worked on the service station, mm. I would have went out, I would have went with my friends because I did have a social life. I did a semi-double on the cab. I'd work Saturday night to Sunday, like Saturday 3 a.m. to Sunday at 9 p.m. And I couldn't sleep. I was all buzzy from all the coffee. Yeah, and then Monday, I, was, I wasn't focused at uni. Like, I could barely sit, stu- sit up, you know. So, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to the podcast would, would be familiar with, like, trying to, that, like, how the hustle they're trying to create, yeah. what life they're trying to create and where they're trying to get to. Because it's a, it's a common story. Crazy because the reason you're probably looking at all of us who are laughing just two, two minutes ago is because literally word for word described what my university experience was like. Because yeah. the boys are laughing about the, the fact that I used to do fruit and veggie deliveries while I was doing my university degree as well to help my old man with his business. Mm. And what used to happen was I used to park the van in the loading zone in the middle of Latrobe University. Yeah. <laughs> And then yeah. I used to always come past the guy's security used to be like, yeah, I know this guy, just yeah. let him go through. Yeah. And I used to park the van smack bang in the middle. Yeah. And, then <laughs> and then I would just go to my classes based off of the the yeah. um, the day. But subhanAllah, something, <laughs> it's just, everything just like, re- it's just too relatable. I was just like, well, is, is, is he talking about me? <laughs> so yeah. yeah. But subhanAllah, um, I wanted to ask how long the university stint was. So like from the, from the obviously the moment you graduated year 12 until... So I did. So I, I graduated in 1990, year 12. Mm-hmm. Well, I pretended to anyway, because <laughs> I didn't get. Well, so I did. Uh, I did six years at uni. Yeah. To 996. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I did the Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws, and then about two years later, I did a Master's of Laws. About ten years later, I did a Master's of Business Administration. So I had, uh, you know, chips on the shoulder. I was trying to prove myself. Yeah. No degrees were enough. You know, I kept on going, kept yeah. on going. Um, and, you know, part of the problem was I didn't have someone to say, hey, why do you need a master's of law for? Like, you seriously don't even like law. Why are you doing a master's of law? Like, that, that advice, that mm-hmm. thinking, that, you know, I probably should have ne- never been a lawyer, even though I don't, don't regret it for one little bit. Yeah. But um, because it gave me so many skills and so much opportunity. But, um, but I probably should have did an MBA early, should have went into yeah. business yeah. and consulting or, yeah. or management rather than law because my personality wasn't attuned to being a lawyer, mm. which is detailed, precise, anal, 
depressed. I'm every, I'm the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like, oh, so if I'm correct, when you were going through your uni years, you didn't feel like you had a, like a professional mentor, someone who's maybe like above you or in your field that you kind of go to, or any of the fields you were kind of interested in? Yeah, look, I had I had a lot of mentors because I always thought that, but they were never. Uh, so there was no professional mentor, mm. but you'd be familiar with this, right? So when I graduated, you needed another official lawyer to move your motion. Mm. And you need someone in a doctor or lawyer or someone of status to, to sign. I, I didn't know anybody else except my teacher. I had to go look for someone, right? And so if you're from the working class and uh, maybe North Melbourne, West Sydney, you know, take your pick. Melbourne's a bit more difficult to do. But they call it Dandenong, for example, as a prime example, right? Well, your, your opportunities are limited to have come across people who, 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 who will take an interest in you and say, yes, yeah, so, hey, look, I'll, you know, for more than just 10 minutes, right? Someone will sit you down and say, well, I think these are your skills, this is the way you should. But look, so I, I don't think you should go into acting, bro. Like, seriously. I know that's your dream, but maybe, maybe you should do podcasts, you know? Because um, you're really good at that. And um, we didn't have that. So I want to be a lawyer, but yeah, we, mm. it's great, you know. But, um, but, but also I was so, I guess, determined and adamant. You have to be really stubborn, like really go for it to actually get to do a law. Mm. So by the time you expended all that energy, nobody said, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, man, like, you know, um, when you get to that stage. Yep. And so... Um, but looking back and talking to my kids and other people's kids now, um, you know, I tell them hard truths. Mm. But then I realise they're not so hard yep. if you take it out of the moment. When someone wants to be an engineer and they're not good at numbers, mm. it's not their personality. Maybe you should try something else. And um, so from my perspective, uh, I didn't have a professional mentor, but a lot of people helped me along the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, 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 the world is always full of kind, generous people. With random acts mm. of generosity, if you go looking for it. Yeah, I know for you, you graduated school in 1990, and you said you did law, arts, and then you did law a couple, a couple years after that, and then you did business admin ten years later. Yeah. So, what was the transition from law, and I know you did some politics in between, to switch into business administration? Was there like a yeah? So, so I, so I, I did law. I got out. I was a PwC, and about eight or nine years in. And so the politics part was I wanted to serve the community. So there's a seat called Auburn, mm-hmm. literally the Sunshine West area. Majority of Muslims live in the area and their majority of numbers. And it was the Australian Labor Party. It was 2001. <clears throat> they decided that, well, one, I was too young. I was 29. Two, uh, that there was a Bilal Scarf rapes. Uh, now, you wouldn't have heard of him here, but a gang of thugs basically assaulted uh, uh, some girls really badly and they were convicted 55 years those guys you know justice Ferner. i think i've heard of this yeah before. you would have heard of it because it was such a famous case yeah but the guy one of the guys was called bilal who got locked up my name was talal <laughs> yeah right and they thought well you know it's too close you'd lose us the seat so they passed me over and said no, no we're not gonna let you run best thing that could happen to me by the way yeah hang on a second you're not subscribed do me a favor, run that mouse or your finger to the bottom there, click that subscribe button, turn on that notification bell as well. Thank you. Best thing. And so from that day on, I decided that I was just going to be practice law. So it's been about another, all up about 10 years in law. Mm. And, um, but it wasn't me, you know. I, I was a very good lawyer. I was a very well-trained lawyer. But can I say, was I the best lawyer? Was I great? Did I love it? Um, I worked really, really hard at it. Yep. But, but by that time, I, I built up a really good practice in corporate law. Alhamdulillah, I was doing really well. Yep. But I thought, ne- what's the next step? The next step is to get to become a partner. And they're the people that, you know, get locked in for 30 years. Mm-hmm. They earn good money yep. in the partnership. But I didn't want to be that person. I don't care what they gave me, you know. And uh, so then I did the MBA, said I should get more skills. And then I decided to go into investment banking. But was there a reason you went and like even in law after ten years? Like yeah. I want to go do an MBA now. Did someone recommend it? Did you just hate law? Was there a case that no, you? I, I didn't want to go to the next step in law. 
Okay. Whether you go to partnership, you're actually, they call them golden handcuffs. So if you leave, you lose money. Mm. Oh, okay. Because right, you're part of a business then. Because you buy in, yeah? You buy in, right? Mm, mm, mm. And, and, and so you become, uh, sorry? I watch suits, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you buy in, and I was like 31 or 30 or something like that, and I'm like, man, I look at the guy, the guy I loved the best, a guy mm. called Mark, right, name, and we're sitting around a partner's meeting, so there's equity partners and non-equity partners. Mm. So partners who are really wannabe partners, they're called partners, they got all the liability, but none of the, none of the equity, of, none of the money, none of the shares. And he was one of the guys that he was, we're out lunch, i never forget it. And he said, so how are you, Talal? And I said, I'm brilliant, Mark. He said, I said you're a bit chirpy today. What's like, kind of happened? Did you build something? Or he goes, oh, Talal, the Conveyancing Act, New South Wales, and the Land Property Act, was p- amended. And so my clients under section 49 as it <laughs> interweave with section 52 will get this benefit. And I said, I love you, Mark, but I don't want to be that in 30 years. <laughs> excited about a conveyancing act. <laughs> he was truly excited. It really meant millions of dollars for his big client, property clients. Wow. And I thought, I, and I like this guy a lot. He taught me a lot. He was magnificent. I was very happy, but do I really want to be that guy in 20 years? Yeah. Um, and that's success, by the way. That's success. Mm. And so, no, nah, it's probably not me. Mm. That's when I decided that I need to do something different mm. and, and and use my other skills. You know, mm. that's what I was going to ask. Like, what was the moment? What was the turning point that made you go? You know what? This isn't actually my. This isn't my cup of tea. You yeah. know, I I need a. And how old were you at the time? Because that'll that'll kind of like predicate. And what was your like your current life situation? Is that'll predicate how difficult of a decision that was at the time? So. Yeah. So, so can I? So I was in the early thirties. Yep. And um, I was married. Yep. I had two kids. Oh wow. And I was working for PwC, probably one of the only of Lebanese Muslims. A lot of Muslims, mm. but they were Indian and Pakistani, and they were middle class Bengalis. And so, but from the Lebanese cohort, North Lebanon, I'm probably one of three mm. in the whole of the firm. Buildings we don't have 5,000 people in, the, yeah. in, in one office. That's and so that's the context yeah. in which I made that decision. But, but I guess that goes to, I guess, the, my broader thinking mm-hmm. about what does true success look like? That they're the symbols of success. You've got a car, you, um, you've got a house, a boat. You know, the, the people think that's success. For me, they're symbols of success and they're halal as long as you earn the halal to you uh, with being humble about it of course but that's not success that is not the definition of success in my view success in my view is achieving something you're passionate about with purpose and which you work hard to strive to it doesn't just sort of happen over a period of time where you're content and People define it as happiness. I don't define it as happiness. Mm. Happiness is a state of mind. I'm always happy, no matter what's happening. When I was driving a taxi, I was happy. When I was working at a service station, I was happy. If I go back to driving a taxi, I'll be a happy guy. You know, disappointed that I don't drive. You know, my I got to drive outside. It's called Uber. You know, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, I have my uh, uh, fifty of my luxuries, right? Mm. But if I didn't have them, I'd still be. It's a state of mind for me, but it's contentment. Mm. Do you have contentment in what you're doing? And, um, and so I wasn't, I was thinking, I've got success, alhamdulillah, beyond my wildest dreams, but was this, is this what I wanted to do uh, with my work-life balance? And I don't define work-life balance as most of the, maybe other people define it, as in, oh, do I have enough time for work? Do I have enough time for play? Do I have enough time for soccer? Do I have enough time for fortnight? You know, <laughs> how is my life balanced? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's not balance. Though. Balance as you become an adult. Um, male or female is what you do for passion and your work mm. and that work can be paid and unpaid and every th- if you're happy with that everything else is balanced yeah. everything else is balanced if you're doing well if you set up a business work-life balance doesn't mean i open it at nine and i find i close it at six and that's my balance you're going to be working 18 hours a day and you're still balanced because you're happy with what you're doing you're taking the risk etc so that's my definition that's i use that definition so I might earn less, I might earn nothing. I might not have a job. But I had a plan. But do I want, what, what is it, where is it that I'll get that contentment 
that can work for purpose. Yeah, that so when I when I look at your story, I I, I can kind of see there's a lot of people who are in and amongst like my me and my, my, my circle, like my relatives and so on that are currently looking at what they do and as you were when you were at PWC, you, you understood that it paid the bills and it was doing well for you and you were actually progressing in your career. But it really wasn't what you were passionate about. So if somebody's in a situation where they feel like they, they're like... Because you're saying you had a wife and two kids at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what would your advice be for somebody in that situation currently? Because they feel like they've been anchored down and they feel like they should just allow life to happen until they're 67 years old and then they'll retire and everything mm. will be fine and dandy. Uh, so, I mean, I had a wife to get, and I did an MBA, Masters of Business Administration, in Melbourne, in Deakin University, in Burwood Campus. Wow. Yeah. So I, 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 would, I did it like online, but every, every, um, every three months you had to fly down for a week, go to Deakin Campus. That's why I learned another thing about Melbourne is that you can't get a bad coffee in Melbourne. It's just almost impossible, right? Which is a, I love that about. I was down, I think, Sydney Road or whatever, some major road. I remember going to Burwood. It was a Sunday morning when we were starting and I, was, I flew in on a Sunday. There's some bloody flower shop. A lot of the <laughs> coffee shops were closed. Flower shop in the middle of a major road. I stopped and I got a coffee from the, the girl. It was one of the best coffee that I ever got made compared to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Sunday morning, right? So um, that's one thing I like. That's just a side note, but but I w- but I wanted to achieve it. And so my advice is, I guess you fall into two categories, and um, one category is: Are you the type of person that is? I want to do my duties as a husband, as a provider, or as a wife, as a provider professionally. Or do I want to seek greatness in purpose? Mm. And what I mean by that is, if you're prepared to do the work and seek a passion and take a risk, and I think I'm talking to a lot of people who have ideas. I've never met anybody who didn't have an idea, a great idea. But most people I meet say the idea's gone. Or I'm going to do it at some stage. If you're prepared to work for it and take the risk with your partner at the time, with your family, and not take the safe road, you're one part of that 1%. But part of that 1% are risk takers and they're no retreat, no surrender people. And they will get up at five in the morning every day like our parents did to think they had to. But sometimes they don't have to and still do it. They will work 18 hour days. They will not whinge about the fact that they didn't get to play Fortnite or they didn't go to the pokies. Not that most Muslims go to the pokies. <laughs> but my point is whatever they're doing in their life, I didn't get to play Arbamiya. Right? Yeah. I didn't get to take the kids. Because people have very excuses in their head. If you're passionate about whatever it is and purposeful, you'll make a business out of it and you'll succeed in it. Yeah. But I find that, and this is the advice, I'm direct answering your question directly. Mm. We are very, very good at the plan and the dream. Very few people are prepared to pay the price for success. And that price is... Hey, you're not going to get seven hours sleep a night. Hey, you're not going to get to do things you like for a long time mm. that you think are pleasure. Hey, you're not going to pick up your kids and go visit your brother, one brother each night, right? Because you finish at 5.30. Tonight we're watching Netflix. Tomorrow I'm going to my cousins. Tonight we're playing Arabamiya. Got the jet skis out, boys. We're going on a weekend. And make sure you bring the boat, uh, Mo, because we're going fishing. And did you see what I caught? And uh, we went, like, if you've got a dream and a passion... That stuff is all not there. And people are like, oh, are you kidding, bro? That's not success. Well, you've got, about, you've got to pick one or the other. You want to, and I don't mean financially. Because mm. whatever you do well, money will follow. If you're a garbage collector, cleaner. If you're a tradie, you're a plumber, you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, you're a professor. One degree, you're 50. None can't even speak English. It's all the same rules. Are you prepared to back yourself in? and work for a purpose mm-hmm. and money follows? Or are you okay with the status quo with a 5% at each way? Mm-hmm. But I want to live a life, you know? And that's a definition of life. And that's what I hear people saying. I've got a side hustle here and a side hustle there. And I'm like, man, that's just entertainment. Yep. I've got a bit of portfolio. I've got a hustle. I've got an app. 
that does this. And I say, how often do you, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. How often do you do it? Well, you know, once a week I have a look at it and, uh, you know, I'm going to build it up slowly. Bro, it's been 10 years, right? <laughs> Focus on something, you know? Yeah, um, so, and, and I have no problem with someone who says, you know, I'm not that 1%. I'm not going to do – I'm not built to do 18 hours. Psychologically, I'm not made up for that, whatever I'm doing. Mm. I'm not a machine, right? Yep. I'm not built for that. That's quite okay, but know that. Accept that and appreciate that and live like that because yeah. you get the benefits of it. But don't don't think you can be in both worlds. It's just not possible. Yeah, definitely. So, brought me back to – I don't know if you've got a question. No, we've only got a couple more <laughs> minutes. Is it? Yeah. Oh, easy. Oh, well. Okay, we've got time. So I've got, I have this that train of thought. Let's come back on the tracks. Oh, Amen. So Excellent. it came back. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So <laughs> and it's, um, it was me. Uh, I just wanted to speak about we're in an era of fast money. Everyone wants to make money now. Cryptocurrency and NFTs and so on and so forth. And nobody understands what the value of hard work is now. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and nobody really understands. Because we, with this podcast, we thought like from the beginning, like, if we're going to do this, we have to put our head down and just go 150% every time. And, and whether or not we get the views or we get the subscribers or so on and so forth, it's going to have to happen every day. Uh, sorry, um, every day we're just going to have to accept it, yeah. you know. And um, one thing that I was looking at is that this generation, a lot of people are very, um, they're very headstrong on waking up rich you know and 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 hoping you yeah, know and rich, yeah. and you know like uh if i just make this right investment or uh, like if i just i i put 500 dollars in this pyramid scheme what i name acn but <laughs> okay <laughs> <up> from there <laughs> yeah. i don't know if everyone else copped it but a lot yeah. of people in my area copped the huddle <laughs> yeah everyone wants to make fast money can you please speak on how a world where you wake up rich one day doesn't exist yeah, so, so I have a different view of that, mm. of the current generation today. So my view is forever and a day when people get older, their memory fades and they start saying, in my day, when I was around, when I was growing up, I don't believe in that shit. I, I believe this generation are a great generation. I believe they're no different to my generation. Or my parents, or their parents, or their parents, or their parents. It's just, when you get older, if you start saying, you listen to that shit, you're doing that stuff, uh, in my day, you know you're old. That's all that, <laughs> that's all that's happened, right? This generation is no different to any past generation. No different. Maybe different tools, crypto, NFT, etc. But they're no different. Everybody wants to succeed. But now it's just more out there, where there's, better ways of take, stealing their money, all right, effectively. I'll explain what I mean. In every generation since, since Prophet Muhammad's time, peace be upon him, there were people who wanted to make it, and it's usually young men and women, but a lot of young, headstrong men who are just looking for the hustle, all right? I'm going to outsmart the system. I'm going to outbid the system. And about 1% do, like outsmart it of that group. Uh, because it's just a random game of luck. That one person said, I made a million dollars, other 99% invest in crypto, or whatever it is. But there's v many versions of it uh, before crypto. Now, but it doesn't change the other 1% rule. That there's only 1% of people prepared to work for what they have achieved. I've never met anybody in my life, even the most famous podcasters, like even Rogan or or Andrew Tate, right, love him or like him, or Jordan Peterson, or, or a Kardashian, or, and you say, well, or, or, or Warren Buffett, or uh, Kobe, they're from different worlds, right? All of them have one thing in common, hate them or love them. They work their asses off, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., so they don't do the 9 to 5, they do the 5 to 9. Number one. Number two, it's called sustainable success, not success. Hey, I did a good deal, bro. I bought the jet skis. Then you can't repeat. Success in the short term is relatively easy, right? Especially if you cheat a bit or you get good luck. It's a long-term success that matters. And this generation is no different to any other generation. 
They're just as hardworking. They're just as good. They're just as able to succeed. But they've got to follow the rules of that 1% if they are part of that 1%. Mm. Nobody ever woke up rich except if you're a Saudi prince. Um, you were born rich and, you know, that's a – or if you're born rich of, as someone's kid. But that's not exactly a great fate. We can talk about it later. Mm. But my point is I'm not going to sit here as a middle-aged man – preaching to a 25 year old you're not working hard enough you're not good enough i actually think you're good enough you can work hard enough you can succeed exceptionally well if you follow the tried and true and only way to succeed and that is self-contentment work hard for a purpose and work long for a purpose and this podcast is a great example today podcast is really really bloody hard and you're talking to people in the air you can't, there's no, nobody clapping for you. There's no ching ching that comes in. It's not a profit and loss. Every day you've got to get up and find people to talk to and you're not sure how it's going to go. Mm. Maybe after, as a lag effect, you can see how many people watched it and whatever. And then one day some boring guy comes and talks and you thought, yeah, that was okay. And then it goes viral and all of a sudden, how did that happen? And then there's the most interest. So I'm just, just painting a picture here. But it's, import, it's, it's for a purpose to have a long period of time and it's, it's something you're passionate about that you're prepared to work for. Mm. Now, compare that to all the boys and girls you talk to and they talk to me about their ideas in life about, man, put an app together to do this and do that and, you know, and six weeks later they got another app story, you know, when you need one or two ideas to work on them. And so I guess the summary of all that is if, if I had to take a takeaway is that this generation is no different to any other generation. Yeah. They're being ripped off by crypto. In past generations, they were ripped off by other systems yeah. that weren't as sophisticated. These are just sexier systems, right? But they've got the same issue. How do I get ahead? How do I hustle? How do I build myself? How do I build my family and my wealth? And there's only one way to do that, and that's a hard way. Any, if it's not hard, in fact, if it was easy, you end up pretty damn distorted and unhappy person Mm -hmm. because as they say islamically and even in a christian religion and even in business careful what you wish for you just might get it and the best way to punish you is to give you everything you bloody dreamed of Mm -hmm. very quickly like the kid that's got 50 million dollars and they're 27 you think they're happy Mm -hmm. you know they didn't work for anyway endless pleasure becomes its own form of punishment absolutely because there's no play the journey and there's been every song in the world. The journey is the pleasure, mm. not even the destination. Because you get to the destination and you realise, I like it, but I like the fact I got here because I struggled. Mm. Mm. You don't like the fact that you got here because joy and pleasure doesn't happen when you get to the destination. If that's what you think, if you think you're going to buy that Ferrari or you're going to buy that Aston Martin, or you're going to go to that holiday, or you're going to marry that woman or that guy, or you're going to build that business, or you're going to get your name on the sign, they're milestones to joy, to, to your achievement, but it doesn't bring you happiness. And if you think that that is your motivator, when you get that Ferrari, you're going to be a very unhappy person. Mm. You know? When you find out that the services cost $200,000 a piece. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, when you find out, but... You, even if you can afford it and you own it and you love it and yeah, it's great, 100%. it's not happiness. It's 100%. like you're going to miss the time you got up at six o'clock in the morning to do a podcast, yeah. you know, because you really enjoyed it. Uh, the time you stuffed it up, the time, because it is that journey. Yeah, and yeah. people, until they get older, because uh, when older people were saying it, they're like, come on, like, you're shitting me. You own a Ferrari, you've done this, you've done that. But once you get down to it, what you really enjoy. Nobody ever lay on the deathbed and said, now that last deal I did, oh, that veranda I built over the water, oh my God, man, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, they, they think of my family, my health, my Iman, what did I contribute? Yep. Uh, and, and so if you think of it that way, it makes sense, right? Yep. But if you're 23, 24, 25, under 30, you, ed- you, you, you built yourself up to a particular position, you're starting a family, so how do I succeed and how I win? Mm. It's only that 1%. Mm. And I feel like sometimes we listen to people when they say they're 70, 80 and they're in their deathbed and they talk about their regrets, they say they work too hard. 
Yep. Something you said today is even when you're working hard, it should be either towards a service to benefit people or it's either something you're passionate about. I don't think people would say they work too hard if there was something they were passionate about or they're right. helping the community or something like that. Yeah, because it's, so it's, it's not I work. I volunteer too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's not work. If, 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 if you, I, I, I'm like a kid in a lolly shop in the Crescent Group, Crescent World Institute for that. I will do 18 hour days. Uh, not because I'm working, because I love what I'm doing. And like a kid in a lolly shop, right? If you, if you put a five-year-old, I got a five-year-old, put him in a coffee sh- a lolly shop, they will eat the lollies until they get sick. Yeah. That's the only time they'll stop because they, 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 they love what they, they love it, right? Mm-hmm. And if you love what you're doing, if you met anybody, let me, if you go to uni, you're doing a subject, you're doing biology. I hated biology. I did one subject in biology. But I met a guy who was so excited and passionate about it, I started to like it, Yeah. right? And I'm terrible at it. If you go to... I don't know, deliver rubbish at the tip. And the person you meet at the tip, obviously they went to school before, yeah. are passionate, the recycling's over there, talal, this here, the refrigerator's over here, all the whites, and the uh, mattresses, don't put them there, put them, they got a special, and they're $120 extra, and that, but they love what they do, they present, they're available, they're joyous people. I'd rather be much rather that person yeah. than the person who's not got joy, and not loving their life. And they go to work every day, even though they don't own it, loving what they do. Mm. And cause I've never met anybody who's built a business that's successful. And I, I mean commercially, not only commercially, because commercial, commercial follows and financially. But any kind of business, any kind of franchise, any kind of ecosystem that isn't, in fact, giving first and doing what they're doing and loving it. Right, like a, a imam builds a mosque. Have you met those imams that come from the old country and they're doing it by in the and they, like you gotta you gotta pray, you gotta come, you gotta you go, go. and then the imam who's who plenty of them in Melbourne, mashallah, was smiling. Assalamu alaikum, akhi. Where do you want to meet? What do you want to do? How do you want to do it? And people flock to them like flies, mm-hmm. right? And I can name you several in Melbourne uh, and Sydney, actually, but definitely Melbourne because there's a few of them. And they're passionate about what they do. They're authentic. They're real, right? And talk about finding f- commercially, what, what do I want, I want the mosque to be built up? Mm. Whole Preston Mosque was built, like, recently. It's happening all over the place. It's the same in life and the same in business. Definitely. Mm. You, c- you, can't, you can't fake that aura. People can sniff it from yeah, a mile yeah. away. Definitely. Yeah. But... Um, after I'm just conscious of time. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll, we'll end up like all the questions that we didn't have answered today. Inshallah, we can even talk about Crescent Wealth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the next time. Day. Well, no, definitely, definitely yeah. will. I think I think we'll continue the journey, Inshallah, uh, in the next podcast. But um, to wrap it up, so Grace doesn't shoot us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't forget. Thank you very much. Talal, yeah. first of all, for coming on, taking time out of your busy schedule, quite obviously. You got your driver, I mean, uh, in brackets, Uber driver. Uber. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks. Well, well it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for putting it on. I'm, 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 I'm honoured that you're having me on and um, I'd love to come back and, and chat. I really, really enjoy um, talking to you guys and talking to the audience through you, you know. Ahla sala, bed baytek. Even Thank though you. it's not my house, you know. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> probably old. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for coming on to like, honestly we'll, we'll definitely have you on again inshallah, inshallah. and then we'll delve into the other topics we wanted to speak about guys don't forget to like comment and subscribe and uh, yeah quickly get off the thing before uh, you know he's, he's got to get going <laughs> so take care <laughs> assalamu alaikum <laughs>